you hate government, one of them libertarian types, or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers. Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, I'm Scott. It's my show, Scott Horton Show. All right, next up is our friend Sheldon Richmond, the author of 10 million articles about why the libertarian answer to everything is the right answer. To everything. Uh, welcome back to the show. How you doing, Sheldon? I'm doing fine. Great to be back with you. Very happy to have you here. Hey, everybody, did you know that Sheldon is now a regular columnist at antiwar.com? Yeah, no, it's true. And um, he also has his own great blog, which is called Free Association at SheldonRichmond.com. What a great name for a blog, am I right? Latest piece <laughs> is Cruz and Rubio, heirs to Bush-Obama militarism. But uh, first, let's talk about Rand Paul. So what do you think about Rand Paul, Sheldon? Well, I'm, I'm not surprised, uh, I'm sorry to say. I mean, his, 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 his uh, campaign had been disappointing all along. He, well, he said some good things here and there. And, uh, you know, during his short Senate career, he did some things like uh, protest the NSA. Uh, I just think that never got translated into, into a clear uh, campaign that gave people a reason to, uh, to vote for him. He made too many concessions. He was terrible on the Iran matter. I mean, he was worse than terrible. Uh, he, um, he'd say regime change has bad consequences, but you know, that was just too weak. Now, you know, maybe a, a pure Ron Paul, uh, foreign policy, uh, uh plank, uh, wouldn't have attract, uh, attracted a lot of voters, uh, and support, uh, these days. I don't know, but he did not give it a try. He just got, I think, lost in the crowd and, uh, I'm not surprised by what happened. Yeah, well, it's exactly what I predicted, that trying to be everything to everybody will leave him nobody or nothing to nobody. I said it right the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and But then, you know, I was worried that maybe I was wrong. What the hell do I know? He's the one who's got himself elected to the Senate somehow. Uh, I sure didn't. So maybe if he does promise Sheldon Adelson to bomb Iran or declare independent Kurdistan for Israel or whatever the hell, then, you know, maybe that'll make him some money and then... You know, maybe Republicans who, after all, love blood more than anything else, maybe they would be, you know, appeased and think, well, geez, I think he's he's good on blood and I think he might be a little better on taxes or something like that. But no, it just didn't take. He failed exactly like he deserved to. So I think. But the question is, what lesson did he learn? Did he learn the lesson that if only he'd been more like Marco, Marco Rubio all along, things would have been better off and, and he'd be in third place now? Or is it possible that he could learn that what was wrong with Ron wasn't his radicalism? It was just that no one had heard of him before. And so he was starting from nowhere. Yeah, I don't know what lessons. Uh, he's not asking me what lessons to learn from it. So I hope he's asking people who would give. Uh, the sort of answer you just gave. Then, uh, if he was more like his father, he would have maybe. Now, of course, you know, let's let's keep things in context. His father had big crowds and generated a lot of enthusiasm, but he only came in third in Iowa. Uh, oh yeah, well, of course. At least those, well, listen, as libertarians, at least, at least we all know that. We all know that we are the minority. There are more communists in America than there are libertarians. We know that. The best that we can do is try to lead the best of the left and the right to the best positions on the most important issues. We can't convert them all. We know that we know that no one named Paul could win a presidential nomination in generations. But that's not the point anyway. You know, and, and as good as Ron's ground game was, they just Karl Rove stole it from his ass anyway, wherever he had the delegates to really, you know, the ground game to really get it done. They just ripped him off because this is a corrupt, evil empire. That wasn't the point. They were never going to let Ron or Rand be the president. The point was to to move the ball forward as far as liberty and especially the arguments on, again, the most important issues, the wars, torture, uh, spying and uh, lawlessness and all this horrible, the bankruptcy that it all engenders and the rest of it. So anyway, um, yep. 
But so, uh, yeah, he ran as Jeb, and then he failed like Jeb. If only Jeb had uh, <laughs> Rand's, uh, you know, uh, whatever, uh, good qualities and would have the decency to go ahead and quit now, but apparently he won't. Um, but so... <laughs> So if it's not going to be Jeb, it looks like the nomination is going to go either to Trump or to Cruz or to Rubio. So you want to take us uh, through one at a time and what you see in these guys? Not what you see in them like you love them, but what you see sure. about them that's important, <laughs> I meant right. to say. Right. Uh, well, the piece I have posted today is on Cruz and Rubio. Uh, and what I try to argue there is that the differences uh, between them are not terribly significant. I mean, the the only one we can really find, uh, the only difference we can really find is Cruz, at least at this point, is saying regime change in Syria would would backfire. Uh, of course, he's right about that, that it would backfire in the sense that it would it would leave bin Ladenites or worse uh, running running Syria, or at least running rampant in Syria. Uh and and he's right about that. Uh, but on everything else, you, you know, I don't see a difference between him and uh, and Rubio on uh, on foreign policy. Uh, if you look at his website, he's got a whole page on how uh, how strongly we must support Israel in every possible way. Uh, he's for giving all kinds of money and and military equipment to Israel, but not a penny to the Palestinian Authority. He says. Uh, and I don't see it. The neocons are not going to, neoconservatives are not going to object to that. The language is very much like Rubio's, uh, who the neocons uh, seem to be gravitating toward. Uh, you know, he wants to, uh, well, famously, he's called for carpet bombing uh, ISIS, he says, uh, to see if the uh, he can make the sand glow at night. Uh, that sounds, that, that, that sentence just overflows with Christian uh, benevolence. <laughs> yeah. I'm very, very happy to hear that. Uh, well, and you know, he had gotten uh, in a little bit of trouble, right? When he had he had used the term neocon a couple of times and said, "I don't believe in all these crazy neocon missions," and he got attacked by some neocons at the Weekly Standard and the National, yeah. or at least the National Review twice. Uh, Eric Edelman and others had complained, but did you see the piece by Rosie Gray about how? And Ali Garib had one too about how the neocons were making nice, and and Cruz was making nice with them again. Yeah, I thought that was more marketing when he when he named the neocons and he even used the term America first, uh, which I'm sure someone must have said uh, something about privately, like you better watch that. You're going to get called a German sympathizer, <laughs> <Nazi> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sympathizer, which was the smear on the America first committee, of course, uh, back in the Cruz uh, is in, in bed with Merkel. The, the 30s. Uh, so I thought that was just marketing. And like you say, uh, we don't hear him say that anymore. And I'm not surprised. That uh, the neocons would be uh, uh, making peace with him. I mean, he, it's possible he get the nomination. And it, like I said, his position is is not uh, terribly different from Rubio's. Uh, and I, you know, and I go through uh, in the piece, I go through some, you know, examples of that. But you know, especially about the Middle East. And they they both, of course, want to, you know, not take any guff from uh, from Putin. You know, they got to sound they got to sound like they're strong and hawkish and and willing to. Uh, uh, confront Putin if necessary. Uh, uh, he seems more, uh, Cruz seems more interested in, in confronting Putin over Ukraine. Uh, I think uh, Rubio has talked about confronting them actually over Syria with a, with a no-fly zone. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, a libertarian non-interventionist is not going to be happy about either one of those. And the point of my piece was to say it's not worth staying up all night ar- and argue, you know, arguing with people over who would be le- less bad, Cruz or Rubio, uh, Trump uh, is interesting in this way. He 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 sometimes strikes a pose that makes him seem more uh, of a realist when he has said, "Hey, let Russia fight uh, ISIS." Or uh, and uh, I think he's uh, also said it, it probably is not a good idea to knock off uh, Assad. Uh, and he has talked about arms going to uh, uh, Bin Laden types, Bin Ladenite uh, types. So he's you know he's made actually some good individual points, but. But overall, there's not there's nothing to comfort a non-interventionist. He wants to, he, as he puts it, bomb the you know bleep out of uh, ISIS. That, that that sounds a little bit carpet bombing, if you ask me. And uh, while he doesn't talk about making sand glow, uh, he wants to take the oil. But that's you know no one ever examines him on that. I mean, it's not like oil is sitting there with a bunch of barrels on a shelf and you run in, grab them, and leave. If you're going to take the oil, don't you have to stay? That sounds like quagmire to me. 
How come no one's asked him about that? He never gets asked. That's because he intimidates reporters. Reporters are afraid to ask him. All right, hold it right there, Sheldon. We'll be right back, y'all, with Sheldon Richmond after this. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium, and they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Robertson Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co. Hey, y'all. Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop, which is, by the way, what he's doing right now, selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at WallStreetWindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. WallStreetWindow.com. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. It's my show, Scott Horton Show. I'm talking with Sheldon Richmond. And, yeah, we're talking about Donald Trump uh, at the break, but eh, we're just talking about the the right side of the political campaign uh, for this interview so far, mostly. Um about Trump and Rubio and all this, and, and we're skipping around. I'm a very disorganized sort. Uh, but right now we're talking about uh, Trump and the whole thing about uh, take their oil. Yeah, it sounds like occupation to me. And, of course, you know, the Islamic State Sunnistan is where the least amount of oil is. I mean, I guess there's some there, but most of the Iraqi oil is down in southern Iraqi Shia Stan and up in Kurdistan and near Kirkuk, which is being fought over, but is, I guess, basically nominally now under the control of the Kurds. So what he's talking about is starting the Iraq war all over again against our allies that we've been fighting for since 2003 <laughs> to take the oil from them and then occupy <laughs> their land and all of that. So he's clearly thought this out. Well, he also said he's going to find the meanest yeah. son of a bitch general at the Pentagon, the uh, the you know, uh, to just go in there and decimate him. You know, like we're just supposed to imagine the meanest armored division ever rolling into Mosul. Okay, so we're back to carpet bombing and and the gr- the ground equivalent. Exactly. Uh, yeah, Jeb so was the, trying yeah, to have- climb on board with him too. Yeah, I think that the lawyers have way too much to say about how we fight the war. <laughs> yeah. Like Jeb, yeah, just old, stay quiet that's a good over there. Old conservative line. Yeah, get the get the lawyers off the backs of the general. That's Please a good clap. Old line. Yeah, I was. Ah, you just stole my line. I was going to say. Oh man. <laughs> oh man. Oh uh, man. Yeah. So there's not a lot to choose from, and uh, you know we can't even count on Bernie Sanders to raise this stuff. I mean, he will mention uh, Hillary. I know we're now over to the Democrats, but well, uh, wait, wait stick with party. Trump here for a second, though. Party. Stay okay. with Trump here for a second, though. Cause so uh, the thing is about him, there's a debate going on. I don't know what's a debate about it really, about whether he's a realist or not. And I guess, you know, yeah. he's a nationalist, right? So he, he's not quite a neoconservative. He comes from kind of a different tradition than that, yeah. but it doesn't make him a realist in the sense of like George Kennan and John Mearsheimer and all of that kind of thing either at all. No. Right? I mean, uh- Two things on that. Uh, Josh, is it Josh Rogan over at the, uh, uh-huh. at Bloomberg with Seth Rogan over at the Bloomberg had a column, uh, claiming that he's actually a realist, that he's actually, that actually is a doctrine. There's a Trump doctrine, but it was a very unpersuasive article. Yeah. I mean, he co- quoted a couple people who know Trump saying, Oh yeah, he's thought all this out. He, he's got an integrated doctrine. We're supposed to take our, uh, uh, Rogan's word for it or w- Rogan took their word for it. So that was unimpressive. I'd much rather look at Stephen Walt's piece in Foreign Policy from just the other day. I think it's linked today at any war, or uh, either today or yesterday, uh, about where he discusses five of the candidates, some of them we've already discussed. And you'll see that uh, you probably already read it, but anybody who looks at it now will see that uh, Trump is not a realist in that in that uh, sense of, of, the, of the people you named. Uh, he's a. Uh, Sure, he's not, he's not a, a new neocon. He doesn't talk about launching a worldwide crusade to bring democracy, the uh, liberal democracy to the world. No, he doesn't talk about that. He doesn't say that. But, but, um, you know, the, he's not, he's not trustworthy. We don't know what he would do in power. First of all, we know he's sort of an egomaniac. So, uh, uh that's not the kind of person I think a, would, a realist would want. That's what, kind of what Walt says or what a non-interventionist would want. Uh, I don't think uh, he thinks there are any limits to what he can do. 
and who knows what he'll decide to do uh, tomorrow. I, you know, I, I, I don't, I find it weird that people think his greatest uh, virtue is that he speaks his mind. Well, the question is, which mind is he speaking today? He's taken many positions on the same topic. Uh, in the recent past, he's, he's had contradictory positions. So, so I don't understand how, he, how anyone can claim that he speaks his mind. What he does is he tells people what they want to hear, and maybe that, they think that's speaking his mind. And on foreign policy, I wouldn't trust him for a moment. He wants to have the biggest military. He's going to spend a ton on the military. He says that. At the same time, he says he's the least militaristic candidate in the race. Uh, and, uh, and then he says uh, he's going. To, the military is going to be so powerful that no one will dare mess quote mess with us. Now, how does he define mess with us? If China wants to take over those un, what, uninhabited man-made islands, is he going to say that's messing with us? Uh, I don't trust. I wouldn't trust the guy for a second. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I mean, everything he says is a whim, and and it's clear he doesn't mean anything he says, and it's clear that he's got. <laughs> well, no sympathy for any other human on the planet or what position they might be in. So that doesn't lend to the idea that he's going to be a very peaceful uh, type of a president at all. Yeah, it's, it's troublesome. Yeah, what if and Mexico then, doesn't want to pay for the wall? Is he going yeah. to bomb Mexico? And now the thing with Rubio, do you think he reads or anything or he's just he's got his talking points and he says them? Or does he really believe all the insane things? Because he basically he just sounds to me like a parroting puppet of Bill Crystal. But he does. Yeah, he does, he sounds like a kid reading a book report kind of thing. You know yeah. what I mean? He sounds like he's he's he reading some stuff he you memorized. Know, I don't know him. I never met him, and I don't know anybody who knows him. I've I've heard it said he's not too bright. He's good at memorizing lines. Uh, I'm a little disturbed. I'm very disturbed, I should say, by his campaign slogan, which is always behind him when you see him speak. Uh, uh, a, a new American century, which of course is a crystal phrase, right? The, uh, what was it? What was the the organization? PNAC. Uh, yeah, the project the, for a new American Sands. century. Yeah, yeah, project for new American century, which was a neocon. Does it still exist, or have they metamorphosed? Yeah, like, no, nah, it's changed system. now, but it's yeah, yeah. It's still well, the same was, old that, guys. Right, the same. So that was a neocon uh, project to promote. Uh, well, you know what? This sort of uh, uh, right now they have the John Hay Institute, and they yeah, have okay. um, they have this other one is um, Beacon Global Strategies. Uh, which again, it's just right. Eric Edelman. That's all it is. Eric Edelman, the guy from the Office of Special Plans that lied you into war with Iraq. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't know why this hasn't gotten more attention. Uh, I guess it's because for most people, it doesn't even raise an eyebrow. But the slogan, a new American century, uh, you know, if Putin was running for reelection and his slogan was a new Russian century, what would the neocons be saying about that? I mean, there's something that's so arrogant. It's this American exceptionalism on steroids. Uh, you know, should Mexicans regard the century as the new American century? Should the French, should the Canadians, should, should anybody? I mean, how arrogant is that? It's not just, the, they're not just saying, hey, for Americans, it's going to be the new American century. No, they mean for the world, it's going to be the new American century. That, that's, that sums up in one phrase all that's bad about American foreign policy and, and this attitude that, you know, we're the indispensable nation and everybody uh, and, and as George H. W. Bush put it after uh, Iraq invaded uh, uh, Kuwait, what we say goes. Well, you know, I wonder about Rubio, man. Um, I thought, well, he's got his little Herman Cain blip moment and and a little flash in the pan, and then he'll be gone again. First of all, because white American Protestant conservative Republican voters, they're not going to turn out to vote for a guy with a O at the end of his name. Because they're, you know, at least soft bigots. If they don't hate Catholics, <laughs> they don't love them and trust them. Wait a them. second. Are they going to be know? fooled by the Z at the end of Cruz's name? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question, too. And they're <laughs> well, down well, to slim Canadian. pickings. I understand it's not easy <laughs> to be hey, a conservative hey, Republican a Cuban, right now. He's a Cuban-Canadian. Trust a Cuban-Canadian? Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, yeah, who, I, whose I candidacy is in direct with, a contradiction I of the Constitution. I say that with tongue firmly in cheek because I think Trump, <laughs> Trump is just shows how pathetic he is when he tries to make a big issue of that. Yeah. Well, okay. I don't know. It is the letter of the law, but <laughs> it's just the Constitution, well, so it doesn't need anything. That. No, the letter of the law. The letter of the law says you got to be a, a citizen, and a natural-born citizen is one who didn't need to be naturalized, and he did not need to be natural. He's been voting 
all his adult life, right? Well, no, I, I read a thing in the Washington Post that he did have to be naturalized. He just went through the quicker process to be naturalized, but he was naturalized. So he was born in Canada. Well, and that, I'd like to see that. Who now, I'll say, send I, you the I, thing I, in the Washington I, Post. Okay. The thing in the Washington okay. Post says that, like, hey, I'm no Obama birther. That was based on a ridiculous thing that he was born in Kenya. But if he had been born in Kenya, then that would be a problem. Sorry, that's the law, even if his mom wasn't American. No, his mother, his mother, well, his mother, Amer- we're, we're getting off on a tangent now, but his yeah. mother was an American citizen. And the, and the English common law and the English law that preceded the United States said that you were a subject of the king if your parents were subjects of the king and you were not born, even if you were not born. Well, that's in, the point argued the in the Washington Post piece. I'll send it to you. Yeah, but I think I think that I, I know I think that that's that woman from Delaware Law School. And, uh, I've seen it said that she is wrong. She just doesn't know what she's talking about. But anyway, we're not going to settle this. Yeah, uh, it makes sense and to plus, me that if your mother yeah, was who cares? Citizen, the Constitution's an entirely dead letter anyway, and Cruz isn't going to win the nomination anyway. He's too much of a bastard. He might have done okay in Iowa, but he's not going to. I don't think he or Rubio is going to go much further. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, Rubio is just the same as Lindsey no Graham. Chance. Lindsey Graham got no support, you know? So I don't know. Uh, and now we're I out of time. Know, Sorry for wasting know, it on the birth of debate. <laughs> Thanks, Sheldon. Oh, SheldonRichmond.com, yeah. y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, you own a business? Maybe we should consider advertising on the show. See if we can make a little bit of money. My email address is scott at scotthorton.org. Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. If this nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone, we are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com. Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new ebook by longtime future freedom author Scott McPherson. Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment and the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. This is the definitive principled case in favor of gun rights and against gun control. America is exceptional. Here the people come first, and we refuse to allow the state a monopoly on firearms. Our liberty depends on it. Get Scott McPherson's Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment and the Right to Keep and Bear Arms on Kindle at Amazon.com today.